everybody! Today we're going to be talking about the quantum dot. Quantum dots, often abbreviated as QDs, are semiconductor nanocrystals with a core shell structure and a diameter that typically ranges from 2 to 10 nanometers. The cool thing about them is that they are able to emit different colors dependent on the size of the molecule. By using quantum dots, we are able to get better images in televisions, energy efficient solar cells, and groundbreaking advances in medicine. The quantum dot is comprised of a core and a shell. The core is composed of elements from groups 2 to 6 on the periodic table, such as cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, groups 4 to 6, such as lead sulfide and lead selenide, groups 3 through 5, such as indium phosphide or indium arsenide. The shell is usually composed of zinc sulfide. The easiest way to explain how a quantum dot works is by comparing it to the hydrogen atom. They are similar because they both contain electrons in quantized energy levels. This means that the energy in an atom is distinct rather than continuous when looking at emission and absorption spectra of atoms. There is a threshold that must be achieved in order to get the atom into the next energy level. It's the same idea as if you are trying to move a heavy box. You will not be able to get the box to move until you are able to apply a certain amount of strength. If you push lightly, you will not move the box lightly. It can also be thought of as rungs of a ladder. You can only place your hands where there are rungs. This can be further explained by using the Bohr model. After the particle absorbs energy, usually in the form of light, an electron moves to a higher G energy level away from the nucleus. When the electron comes back down, it releases energy in the form of a photon, which is the fundamental particle of light. The color of the light emitted typically depends on the energy level and how far the electron jumped. Usually, the color emitted by an atom corresponds to the type of material. For example, iron gives off green and sodium gives off yellow light. In the case of quantum dots, however, the color emitted depends on the size of the dot. The smaller the dot, the more energy is required to get to the next energy level and the smaller the wavelength. When the quantum dot gets excited, energy is added and it moves to the next level. This can be shown from observing a band gap diagram. The band gap diagram shows the required energy levels that are needed in order for the electrons to jump from the top of the valence band to the bottom of the conduction band. We can control the size of the quantum dots directly by how we make them. A simplified version of the chemical reaction to make quantum dots starts out by heating up cadmium oxide to a very high temperature. Selenium is then added to the solution and we take out samples over time. The longer the crystals sit in solution, the larger they become. As you can see, the size of the wavelength correlates to the size of the dot. Blue dots are the smallest at 2 nanometers and shortest wavelength, green dots are 3 nanometers, and red dots are the largest at 6 nanometers and have the longest wavelength. So why are we excited about this? Well, the most common known use of quantum dots are their new role in LED televisions. TVs emit blue light, activating these quantum dots, which then emit their own colors dependent on their size. This leads to enhanced colors observed on the screen as well as making the TVs more energy efficient. But quantum dots have much larger implications, such as their potential use in renewable energy. Solar cells have limits to their effectiveness in converting the energy from the sun in the form of photons into usable electrical energy. This maximum conversion of sunlight to electrical energy is called the shockley quasar limit, and places a constraint that only 33.7% of sunlight can be converted into electricity in solar cells. The average efficiency of modern solar cells is currently around 10%. However, since quantum dots are activated by a wide range of wavelengths from the sun, when they emit their wavelengths of light, those can be additionally captured by the solar cells to be converted into electricity, increasing the efficiency of the solar cell, therefore bringing it closer to the shockley quasar limit. Quantum dots have also found their way into the biomedical world. In 2008, a team of scientists in Japan attached quantum dots to epidermal growth factors, EGF, which are popular targets for cancer therapy. By attaching QDs to an EGF, it is possible to create a highly selective nanoprobe. This nanoprobe is then used in conjunction with fluorescent imaging to safely and more accurately distinguish between tumors and healthy tissue in vivo. One issue to be considered when using QDs in living organisms is the toxicity. Heavy metals used in these quantum dots raise some concern about its impact if left inside the body. While small QDs with sizes less than 5 nanometers can be removed from the kidney, QDs with larger sizes are more difficult for the body to secrete. 
In order to make them safe for use in living organisms, QDs are often capped with hydrophobic or water-hating molecules and need to be solubilized in aqueous solution before practical use. The solubilization step can be achieved by wrapping QDs with polymers that are amphipathic. This means they display both hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties. Or you could also protect the polymer with water-soluble silica shells. This gives us a non-toxic and biocompatible way to label and target various receptors in the body. So now you know all about the super cool nanocrystals called quantum dots.